and welcome to the stories of Northern life from the Sault Ste. Marie Museum. It is February, which means it is also Black History Month, and we don't have anything in the collection here at the Sioux Museum on the topic of Black history. But while listening to another podcast episode titled Works of Art by American Shadows, the Sioux Museum's executive director, Will, discovered an African-American and Ojibwe artist whose famous work has a connection to Sault Ste. Marie. Her name is Edmonia Lewis. Nobody knows when she was born. Along with most others born in a lower social economic status at the time, she would always give different responses when asked about her age. But we do know that she was born in New York sometime in July, we guess in the early to mid 1800s. Her mother was Afro Indigenous of the Ojibwe people and lived in Credit Reserve on Lake Ontario. Her father was also a mystery, but we do know she has a half-brother named Samuel. He was nine years older, but the age gap proved no difference, as they were inseparable. They had a lovely life in Greenbush, New York. But when she was nine, both of her parents passed. Edmonia and her older brother moved to Niagara Falls to live with her mother's sister. Despite the tragedy, they both thrived in their own ways. Edmonia made traditional Ojibwe crafts, as her mother taught her, which tourists happened to love. She would sell all her artwork along with the works of her aunts as well. She also spent her time fishing, hunting, swimming, and exploring the great outdoors along with her brother and other children that lived nearby. Her brother eventually left the Niagara area and headed west with what was called the gold fever. She was devastated, and rightly so, because Edmonia never saw her brother again. But he did help support her throughout her life. Edmonia herself left Niagara too, to attend school. She was welcomed at the progressive Oberlin College in 1859. It was not an easy ride for Edmonia, as she ran into a few incidents while at school. After a series of racist attacks, including being beaten by a white mob for being accused and acquitted of poisoning two white roommates, she was also unable to finish her last term at Oberlin following allegations that she had stolen paint, brushes, and a picture frame. They diminished the theft charges, but asked her to leave with no chance of completing her education, only one term short of a degree. But still determined to have a successful career, she moved to Boston, again with financial help from her brother. One day, she saw a statue of Benjamin Franklin and thought she could learn to make statues too. And this is where things took a turn for Edmonia. In Boston, she met several people who favored the abolition of slavery, such as William Lloyd Garson, who supported her work. She also met many that didn't. She went around asking sculpting tutors to be her mentor, and they all turned her down. Male sculptors usually learned sculpting by taking anatomy classes first, but women were not allowed to take science classes and a lot of other subjects too at the time. Luckily, she found Edward Augustus Brackett, a sculptor who specialized in creating busts, and he agreed to take her on as a student and help her set up her own studio. With his training, she began to make and sell clay medallions, and many Boston women would commission her too. She continued to hone her skills and eventually caught fame with her piece on Robert Shaw, a white man from Massachusetts who headed into the Civil War with Americans' first all-black regiment. He stood by the men when they were ambushed and died with them. She went on to sell copies of the bus, too, gaining a good amount of money. 
With the fame and influx of commissions, she was able to save enough money for her greatest dream to come true. This dream was to move to Europe in search of great inspiration for her art. She also had a strong desire to give back. So before she made her dream come true, she moved to Richmond for a little while and taught basic education to newly freed people of color. Eventually, she did make enough money to move to Europe, and once she did, she set sail to Florence, Italy. The neoclassical sculpture was popular there due to the number of marble quarries. And soon after arriving, she made many friends with locals and American expats. She was pleased that color and sex was not nearly as controversial as it was in the States. She traveled all over Europe in search for inspiration, went to places like Paris and London, but came back to Italy and settled in Rome. At the time, sculptors paid stone crafters to help. She lacked the resources, so she did all the work herself. She created many busts of famous and influential people, but her subjects were mainly African American or Native American. Her work stood out amongst the rest. Her depictions had a more respectful reality than the stereotyped versions of her fellow artists. Her most famous sculptures are a series of busts of Hiawatha and Minnehaha, based on the poem The Song of Hiawatha, written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Sound familiar? This is the connection to Sault Ste. Marie history and why we are talking about Edmonia Lewis today. So who is Henry Wadsworth? Well, he is a famous American writer that befriended Henry Schoolcraft and used him as a source for his writing, which leans to the story being based on indigenous stories from the Lake Superior region. Now, who is Henry Schoolcraft? I talked about him in the Johnston family episode from a while back. But in short, he was an American geographer and geologist noted from his early studies of Native American cultures. He served as the United States Indian agent in Sioux, Michigan, and married Jane Johnston, the famous fur trader of the American side's daughter. Now that we know these people, we can talk about the story and the characters Edmonia carved into stone, Hiawatha and Minnehaha. The name Hiawatha comes from a real person, a pre-colonial Native American leader and co-founder of the Iroquois Confederacy. Longfellow most likely took the name of Hiawatha and applied it to the Ojibwe demigod known as Nanabush, the Ojibwe trickster figure and culture hero. Nanabush or Nanabozo figures show up prominently in their storytelling, including the story of the world's creation. Minnehaha translates to laughing water or waterfall or rapid water. She is a Dakota woman and is the lover of Hiawatha in the story, though this love story does have a tragic end. Ammonia created other pieces inspired by the song of Hiawatha like the one titled Old Arrow Maker, where Minnehaha plates mats of flags and rushes while her father makes arrowheads of jasper. It is a direct depiction from an expert from Song of Hiawatha. Both figures look up as if greeting Hiawatha, whose presence is implied by the deer he had brought as a token of his courtship. The sculpture implies the bringing together of the Ojibwe and Dakota people after years of intertribal war. This sculpture was popular like many of her pieces, and Ammonia made many copies of the old arrow maker too. In the middle of writing this episode, I was visiting Fayetteville, Arkansas, USA. Where is that and why was I there? It is in the northwest corner of Arkansas a state north of Louisiana and south of Missouri. I was there to visit my boyfriend, and we went to the Crystal Bridges Museum, which is a beautiful free museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. As an artist and someone who works at a museum, I have a list of names at the top of my mind that I could recognize while walking through a museum space. 
And as I was walking around the first gallery of the museum, I noticed a small marble sculpture from the back and slowly walked around it. There it was, the old arrow maker by Edmonia Lewis, right in front of me. If that's not synchronicity, I don't know what is. I was still under the impression that the sculpture was at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So you can imagine my surprise seeing it there. In 1869, Longfellow the poet actually visited Monia's studio in Rome and posed for one of her portraits, which was soon after acquired by Harvard University. Some praise me because I am a colored girl, and I don't want that kind of praise, Monia said. I had rather you would point out my defects, for that will teach me something. Even though we are talking about her today in honor of Black History Month, her art and character speaks for itself. Lewis's subjects derived from Longfellow were unique and reflected longevity, bonds between generations, tradition, and peaceful toil. She depicts the beauty and humility of her subjects not seen at the time. I don't think we know enough of her story and progress as an artist to point out her defects. I do have to say her proportions and anatomy are spot on for not being allowed in the science classrooms. And we do know that she did all of this as a woman of color at a time where there was so much rooting against her. She pushed through every barrier she faced with her head up high. Her confidence, belief in herself, and her determination to reach her dreams is inspiring. And all of this while being a giving and caring person, she was able to achieve great things. You don't need to go all the way to Arkansas to see her work. I recommend you look at Monia Lewis online. There are many pieces that have an incredible story through the years, like her life-size piece of Cleopatra's death. It took her four years to complete, but eventually it was taken out of the art world for over a century. It served as a centerpiece of a Chicago saloon. Then a racehorse owner and gambler bought it to place on a racetrack grave of a horse named Cleopatra. It stayed in front of a crowd at the Harlem racetrack in a Chicago suburb for many years. The property eventually became a golf course, a Navy munition site, and finally, a bulk mail center. In all kinds of weather and graffiti, it slowly deteriorated, while well-meaning amateurs tried to improve her appearance. It wasn't until the 1800s that it was handed to the Forest Park Historical Society. Then, in 1990, it was donated to the Smithsonian and restored to its former glory based off a single photo. Crazy, right? Well, I hope you learned a little something new, maybe not about Sault Ste. Marie history this time, but you learned about an incredible woman that used our history as a source of inspiration, impacting and influencing the public view on Native Americans for years to come. At the end of 2022, the U.S. Postal Service unveiled its 45th stamp in the Black History series, a portrait of Edmonia Lewis. This is just one example of how we share and spread history. There has been a great increase in attention on Lewis's life and work in recent years. It has brought new works to life and placed a renewed appreciation on Ammonia's accomplishments, both in the art world and within the mid 19th century America. Every barrier is worth breaking if it's gonna get you to whom you want to be obtaining your wildest dreams. Anything is possible if you try and believe you can. Take Edmonia's life story as inspiration for your own life. Get out there and turn those dreams into reality. Come back again next week for another episode of the Stories of Northern Life. Next week's episode is in honor of Black History Month again, on a man who grew up here in Sault Ste. Marie and later achieved amazing things. See you then. Ciao for now. Thank you.